we are gonna just um, hit up some few questions, some few questions, and then uh, uh, we continue with those questions which are likely to be in your paper. All right. Okay, let's start the uh, question two. They're saying the diagram below shows the part of the brain. Obvious, you can see it. That's the part of the brain. Okay, mm -hmm. what are they asking? They are saying that identify part A. What is this part A? You can identify all of the parts. For example, uh, part A is um, cerebellum. Cerebellum. Part uh, B is medulla oblongata. Part C is uh, putare grand or hypophysis. Part A is uh, hypothalamus. Sorry, this is hypothalamus. And part D is uh, cerebrum. Now, state two function of part D, which is cerebrum. It has three functions. The first function is, is the center for higher thought processes, which is memory, judgment, and reasoning. Number two, it coordinates all voluntary actions. For example, raising the hand, sitting, standing, things you do on your own will. And then lastly, it receives and interprets all the sensations, all the sensations. For example, seeing, uh, hearing, tasting, all that. Those are sensations. So all that, those are the functions of cerebrum. Name the hormone that's stimulated by gland C that has an effect on, number one, long bones. That is growth hormone. It is growth hormone which has the, the effect on um, long bones. It brings about the growth of these bones. And then now they are saying that mammary glands, that is prolactin. Prolactin, if you look at a hormone called prolactin, pro lactin, you know the word lactogen from ShopRite. This, that is milk. So lactin is milk. So uh, lactose is milk sugar. So anything related to lact, it means that that is uh, milk. You must think about milk. So the answer is prolactin. And then they're saying that state one way in which the brain is protected. It's protected in three ways. By the three layers, which we call the meninges, uh, the cerebrospinal fluid, and then also by the cranium, the, the, the cranium. So it is the cranium, not the whole skull, the cranium, because the skull, when you talk about the skull, it includes also the jaws. So you better use the word cranium. Remember when you're talking about the brain size, uh, how is the brain size? And the cranium, we said that don't talk about skull, talk about cranium. Then they're saying that describe the role of, um, uh, uh, describe the role of hypothalamus uh, in regulating. How is hypothalamus able to regulate um, mm, thermal regulation? Remember that uh, it, how does it control thermal regulation? What is thermal regulation before you know the function of hypothalamus uh, in this regard? Thermal regulation is when the temperature is being kept constant okay, under a narrow uh, range. So how is the hypothalamus able to do this? So when you talk about hypothalamus, hypothalamus might, must work together with the skin. How? Now, this hypothalamus, it will receive and interpret to receive and once it receives it will interpret the impulse being received and then uh, where is this impulse coming from from the receptor where the receptor it could be the skin or in the blood vessels depending on the where the temperature is but mostly uh, on the skin so it receives and then interprets that uh, 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 yeah, impulse uh, obtained from the receptor which is the skin and then sends the impulse to the blood vessel so when the blood vessels um, when it sends the impulse to the blood vessel, this, it will depend on whether uh, the blood vessel will constrict or it will dilate. 
Eh? Because they said thermal regulation. They didn't say that in cold conditions or in hot conditions. So when it, it sends the impulse to the blood vessel, the blood vessels will either constrict or will dilate. And then it will not stop there. Yes? It will also uh, influence how much blood is flowing under the skin. So if it, it is dilated, it means more blood. If it has constricted, it means that uh, less blood will uh, will what will flow under the skin. It does not stop there. Remember, thermal regulation involves the skin and the sweat gland. So now it will also influence the sweat gland, either by the sweat gland producing more sweat or by the sweat gland producing less sweat. So it will influence the blood vessel, the blood which flows on the skin or in the skin or under the skin. And then also it will also influence how the sweat gland will work. So basically you can say that it receives and interprets impulse from the receptor that is the skin. And also now it sends the impulse uh, to the blood vessels either to uh, of the skin, either to constrict or to dilate understand and also influences um, the sweat gland either to be more active or it becomes less active basically that's what you need to know because they didn't ask you whether it is uh, cold conditions or in under 40 conditions part b is involved in homeostatic control of the carbon dioxide concentration yes State the location of the receptor that is stimulated by the increase in the carbon dioxide concentration in the blood. Where is part B? Let's first see what is part, 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 part B. Part B is the medulla oblongata. So what is the receptor? Where is the receptor? The receptor are found in the, in the, in the blood vessels, which we call carotid artery. Carotid artery. Carotid artery. These are blood vessels. Um, carotid. Yes. Carotid arteries. These are arteries. Arteries. Where they found you are found at the upper part of the of the human. Basically, the neck, the chest, the neck. Yeah, moving from the, the end of the neck to the chest to the part of the the head. That's the lower part of the head. Yeah, we call them carotid artery. So that's where the receptors are found. And then uh, B, they're saying that name the two effectors that part B sends impulse to. Where is part B now? Part B or uh, receptors. If you look at it, there are two things which uh, it sends impulse. It sends impulse to the heart so that the heart can either increase or decrease. Uh, basically, the heartbeat increases so that it uh, sends blood to the muscles and then picks up carbon dioxide. Number two, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. Diaphragm is also another tick and intercostal muscles so that the breathing rate can increase and the depth can also increase so that carbon dioxide is pumped out of the body. Carbon dioxide, we don't need it in the body. That's why it's supposed to be pumped out. We don't have the other way of the negative feedback mechanism for it. Then they are saying that uh, another question is about reproduction, and that is the female, that is the male. You have A, which is uh, vas deferens, B, which is epididymis, and C, which is testis. Identify A, we have seen it, which is vas deferens. Uh, they are saying that state the function of B. What is B? What is B? That is the uh, epididymis, the function of the epididymis stores. Uh, Spams for maturation. Yes, yeah, store as sperm for maturation. And then they're saying during vasectomy, that is the cutting. Uh, when you talk about the vasectomy, is the cutting. Ne? Yes, the cutting of the epi, uh, of the vas deferens. A is cut and tied as shown in the diagram. Semen will not be released during copulation. Explain the composition of semen after vasectomy. Yes, basically, semen will not contain. Um, Semens will not contain sperms because now it has been blocked. Né? If you look at it here, the sperms are here. They have been blocked. It means that they can't go up. So basically, they won't contain sperms. Why? Because they won't be transported. 
And if they are not transported, it means that what will contain in the semen, it will be only the fluid coming from the accessory glands. And what are the accessory glands? Accessory glands are the prostate gland, uh, vas deferens, sorry, vas, um, prostate gland, corpus gland, and semino vesco. Those are the three accessory glands which are supposed to be there. Then they're saying that um, describe how, explain how this condition may affect fertility. How this will affect fertility? If 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 uh, which which situation now? Oh, okay. In some cases, male are born with the C located part C located inside the body, which it will fail to descend into the scrotum. Mm -hmm. Where is C? Oh. The testes which produce the sperms. So how, explain how this will affect. Basically, it will affect because the temperature of the testes inside the body will be too much. And then if the temperatures are too much, the sperms will not be produced on the high, high quantities. Remember, for fertilization to take place, you need a high number of sperms. And then now, if it has produced less sperms, it means that the sperms may not be enough to carry out fertilization. And then now, what happens? Definitely, it means that um, fertilization, it, it, you have problems with the, with the fertilizing. Like you see people having, for example, uh, two, two couples, they, they, uh, they are looking for a baby for a long period of time. But the problem could be, um, if not the, the side of the lady, side of the man, one of the problems could be that the men produce less sperms uh, so that they can travel. Remember to, to, to swim from the uh the, the the vagina to the fallopian tube where fertilization takes place it's like swimming across indian ocean you have to be with a lot imagine the people in in this country south africa for example and then you put all of them to swim across indian ocean very few will survive to the end and there will be so many uh, uh, um, obstacles during that course you understand so very few will swim across the what the Indian Ocean. So it means that you have to be with a large number of sperms so that at least some can swim to the end and then they cut out fertilization. So if you have less number of sperms because uh, the testes are up and they, they can't provide favorable temperature for the sperm production, that's why they're hanging so that they can provide favorable temperature for sperm production, then it means that the sperms will be few in numbers. And then if there are few in numbers, they are most likely not to reach the fallopian tube to carry out fertilization. If they don't reach there, it means that the consequence will be less ability or less um, probability of the egg to be fertilized. That's the meaning. Describe the process of uh, spermatogenesis. Spermatogenesis, um, spermatogenesis, we have to explain the way how we are supposed to explain in the modern way. Uh, of our examination guideline. So it's not like the way we are explaining them in the previous books. So in our book, you can see exactly how you're supposed to explain it, but this is how you're supposed to explain it. When you talk about the process of spermatogenesis and eugenesis is almost the same. So you can say that under the influence of the testosterone, the diploid cell, which is to end, yeah? the diploid cell, which is to end, yes, will undergo what we call uh, meiosis. And this diploid cell is found in the seminiferous tube. So it will undergo my, 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 my meiosis to form the haploid sperm cells. Basically, you have one cell divided into two, then divided into four. These are the ones which form. Uh, so under the influence of testosterone, we give you a tick. You mentioned the word testosterone. The diploid cell, this diploid cell, which is 2N, will undergo uh mitosis when it undergoes mitosis it forms uh, which is found in the seminiferous tube and then uh it forms uh using the word my my meiosis it will undergo meiosis it will also tick so testosterone is a tick meiosis, uh, meiosis is a tick and then uh, where is it located in the seminiferous tube is another tick so those are three ticks um and then uh to form 
the uh, haploid, the word the haploid, haploid, one end. Yeah, haploid sperm cells is also a tick. Basically, that's what we want. Nothing else. Don't put too many words. We don't want them. That's what we want. When you're marking, that's what we are looking for. Go to our book, download it, and then try to use it, and then you see if you want to get a distinction. All right. Mm -hmm. They're saying that um, describe how the development of the embryo is protected and nourished in the uh, oviviparous uh, organisms. How is the development of the embryo nourished and protected? So uh, they are saying that describe how the developing embryo uh, is protected and nourished under OV of oviviparous animals. So these are animals whereby you have um, OV, which means the ovum. And then vivi means inside. So it means that the, the ovum is developing inside the mother's body. Yes, but it does not in, uh, obtain nutrients from the mother. It obtains nutrients from the ovum. That's why it's called ovoviviparous. So how is it uh, nourished and protected? Basically, you have two questions which we are supposed to answer. So we are supposed to look for way forward for protection and you are supposed to look for way forward for nourishment. So protection... You look at the amniotic egg, the way the layers, the, what you call the extra embryonic membranes. The first one is the um, the allontois. This one protects the embryo uh, by removing the waste, uh, the waste product. Allontois is basically for wasty product. You understand? And then you talk about the um, amniotic fluid, uh, which is very important for for shock absorber it it helps in the shock absorber then you can talk about the shell which is very important for covering and uh, uh, uh for protection Br brings about the protection these shells they have holes small 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 holes to allow the air to go through yes and then you can also talk about it is inside the mother's body that's why it's all is vivi. Ne? It's inside the mother's body. So it means that it won't be eaten by the predators. To eat that egg, you have to eat the mother. Yes. It's like a get. To reach the eggs, you have to eat the mother. And then you reach the eggs. So it is being protected by the mother. So you can talk about um, something like that for the for the baby. But you saying because it is uh, vivi, paras, you need to talk about is being protected by the mother first, at least. Yes. Then number two is, is nourished. How is it nourished? The embryo receives nutrients from where? It receives nutrients from the egg yolk, not the mother. I said it. That's why you have this word ovo. Not the mother, from the egg yolk. And then um, uh, also it also receives nutrients uh, from the albumin. That is the outside part, uh, the, that white part. When it...